Hi everybody. This lesson is going to focus on the last of the design features of culture that you'll find on the first study guide on page 12. That is, culture is differentially shared. A byproduct of this is what social scientists refer to as a subculture. And this is more or less a working definition of a subculture. If you'll notice, it's a category or group of people that share many of the aspects of a larger culture, but they're marked by characteristics that you don't necessarily find elsewhere in the larger culture. They are, in essence, as you will note on page 13 of the study guide, a culture within a culture. Sociologists using the functionalist perspective tend to focus a lot of attention on what major functions are performed by subcultures. What are some of their benefits? Well, certainly one is identification. In large, complex societies and organizations, as well as in smaller, less complex ones, subcultures provide a way by which people can distinguish themselves. It permits them um, to pursue common interests or sets of experiences and more or less stand out in a crowd. Bodybuilders, for example. Likewise, some of you may be familiar with Revolutionary War reenactors or Civil War reenactors. These folks, again, illustrate graphically the fact that subcultures can provide a source of identity. Uh, if you've got a particular interest, you can get involved. And again, folks who are civil or revolutionary war reenactors, they get into this in a, in a really significant way. Uh, likewise, uh, another example that some of you may be familiar with what's referred to as Trekkies. Okay, those people who admire and follow very closely uh, Star Trek. Uh, they will show up at conventions, etc. So once again, one of the more important functions of subcultures is they provide a set of, a, literally an identity, if you will, uh, a way by which people can focus in on shared interests, etc. Likewise, it's important to remember that subcultures have knowledge necessary to perform highly specialized tasks in any society. Here in the United States, I'd simply ask you this question, what's your major? On the other hand, bear in mind that subcultures can frequently serve as a source of adaptation. In other words, it's often through subcultures that significant changes first emerge. It's interesting to note that in some subcultures, you may find within their structure a number of smaller subcultures, what are called microcultures. At a community college campus, for example, you have students, that's a subculture, but within that student subculture, you might focus on, well, who among these students are married? Who among these students are working full-time or part-time? Could you also distinguish some students based upon the high school from which they matriculated or graduated? Could you also focus on their major or their minor? All of those are kind of microcultures within the larger community college student subculture. And often, any adaptation or change will start within some of these microcultures, spread into the other realm or area of the subculture, and then eventually out into the larger society itself. Um, a good example of this is the women's movement. Uh, it was first uh, adopted by young, urban-based, well-educated people, primarily women, and then it spread outward into the larger society itself. Um, when you think about significant developments 
in American culture concerning fashion, musical styles, film, and the like. A lot of the changes linked there are tied to three categories of people. They don't necessarily have a great deal of power and influence, but nevertheless, they shape significantly developments in these areas. Can you identify them? What about the young? What about African Americans? What about gays? Now, on the other hand, conflict-oriented sociologists tend to focus a lot of attention on the fact that subcultures often serve as a means by which groups act on behalf of their own self-interest. In other words, within the context of these groups, the members can literally act on behalf of common interests that they share. And these interests might reflect the group's economic status or position, or maybe other significant characteristics like gender, race, ethnicity. In this way, a subculture becomes literally more than just a source of identity. It could become a kind of a political statement through which the members seek to control their own destiny or reject certain aspects of the larger culture or a combination of the two. This might very well lead to the development of what is called a counterculture. This is a subculture, but if you'll notice, it's marked by characteristics that may very well be at odds with, in opposition to certain aspects of the larger culture, or very, very different from the dominant culture. Now, this might be in the form of norms, values, or a combination thereof. Now, countercultures don't necessarily engage in illegal or antisocial activities. As a matter of fact, it's pretty safe to say that that is true of literally almost all countercultures. Now, it's possible that some might very well challenge certain mainstream ideas and notions. That was true during the 1960s when the hippie counterculture emerged. It was marked by a wide variety of challenges to mainstream or dominant cultural values, notions, and ideas. Yet there was a considerable amount of diversity within the so-called hippie counterculture. Some were basically concerned with experimenting with altogether new lifestyles rejecting monogamous marriage, monogamous-based sex. Uh, some also questioned the value and the importance of the capitalistic economic system. Others were more into experimenting with drugs, uh, taking advantage of Timothy Leary's suggestion of turn on, tune in, and drop out. Still others took a uh, what would be considered at the time in the minds of some people a rather radical stance on the role of the United States in a variety of world activities, particularly the war in Vietnam. Some of these folks were even willing to employ violence to accomplish their goals, making up a sort of branch, if you wish, of the hippie subculture that was known as the radical weathermen. But remember again, most countercultures don't engage in illegal or antisocial behavior. And also what's rather important for you to remember is that certain aspects of countercultures may over time be absorbed or borrowed by the larger, more dominant culture. For example, many aspects of the hippie subculture of the late 1960s made their way into mainstream culture. Wide, and still around today, widespread use of the peace symbol, uh, longer hair for men, changed views and social norms as to some drugs, such as marijuana, 
the demand for civil rights, and likewise some forms of clothing and a less restrictive approach to notions about sexuality. In the next lesson, we'll look at two specific types of countercultures identified by some sociologists here in the United States, the Old Order Amish and the Earth Liberation Front. Until that time, keep thinking about the significance of subcultures.